Perfect. Now, ordinance. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, thank you all for having me. Um, not only going to talk about ordinance and what we do, but I'm going to try to, of course, talk about it in relation to quality and what I get out of uh, ASQ because we do do a lot of quality control and quality assurance and that's very important in the, in the business I'm in and I'll tell you more about the business um, but I have in my association through my association with ASQ and my certification I've been trying to apply the broad range of quality concepts to what I do and that's not really being done all that much in my business. Um, I have some guests here tonight. I didn't know if anyone was going to show up, so I brought my own audience. And I have uh, two people here, Ted and Marianne, from the parent company that bought me about five years ago. And that's kind of interesting. That started at an ASQ meeting. I came to my first ASQ section meeting because you had a fellow. He was very, very tall, very big guy, elderly, gray hair. That describes most of us, but he, he, was, he was a speaker. And he, he specialized, I don't know if you remember him, it was probably six years ago, he specialized in acquisitions and putting companies together. And so I was just thinking about starting to sell my company and I came and I actually retained him to, because the first thing when I was talking to him about it, he said, well, what's your company worth? What's it valued at? And I had no idea how to do that. So I retained him, he put together a basic concepts uh, evaluation and through that, I sold my company to Total Environmental Concepts, and they have two representatives here tonight. We also have uh, Dan West, who's my insurance broker, and the insurance broker for Total Environmental Concepts. And my goal is to tell him a little bit about what I do, but not scare him too much. <laughs> and my wife, Kim Green, who is, runs the office of the chief scientist for U.S. Department of Agriculture. All of these people, and my guests here tonight, have two things in common. They don't really know what I do <laughs> in detail. They, know, they, they have about, sort of, kind of. And they all should be more involved with ASQ. And people at their company should be more involved with ASQ. Because there's more here than, than they really, I think, um, that anybody understands until you become involved in it and start applying this stuff to your daily life. So with that, let's, let's move on. Um, one thing about me, I'm the president of this company, UXO Pro. I was bought by Total Environmental Concepts uh, almost five years ago. Uh, I'm still the president of the company. It's still an independent company. They own me. I don't own me. I never wanted to own a company that was out of necessity. I ran the company for about 15 years and then sold it uh, and have been very happy with that arrangement. We are technical consultants to uh, state environmental regulators. So I work for Virginia, Alaska, Puerto Rico, Massachusetts, Alabama, Texas. I work for a lot of states. States have the oversight role in managing the uh, DOD cleanups in their state. Sometimes the EPA is involved. I'll talk about that a little bit when they get involved. But mainly the state regulators are the main primary regulator. So they want to make sure that their land is going to be cleaned up, suitable for its reuse. I am a former Navy diver and EOD technician. EOD is Explosive Ordnance Disposal. I'm going to try not to inundate you with acronyms, uh, but that's one I can't avoid. Um, when I got out of the Navy, I went to work for UXB International. After several years, I went to IT Corporation. That's transitioned a lot. That went, became IT Group, became a bunch of other things. Now it's CB&I. So it went through a lot of, there's been a lot of acquisitions in the environmental business and I am a uh, uh, ASQ manager of quality and organizational excellence a title that I always find kind of amusing organizational excellence but okay I passed the test you know so what are we going to do here um, munitions response I'm going to use that acronym that's one acronym I'm going my, my business is full of acronyms many of them you can't even pronounce but munitions response covers the gamut sort of of what we're doing. And it's really probably the only one that, that you need to know. What munitions response is, is the um, Department of Defense trains people to fight our wars. That's the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps. They train with ordnance on training ranges, right? So they fire the stuff, some of it practice, some of it live, they train with it. And they need places to do that. And then we close these places down. And when we close these places down, in the past, pretty much after every major conflict, if you go start at 
you know, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and now our current conflicts. After those things are over, we close a lot of these places down. So today, we close them down in a very environmentally conscious manner, and that's called the Base Closure Program. It's a separate pot of money within DOD. The other pot of money I deal with a lot is called the FUDS program. Sorry about the acronym, formerly used defense sites. So those were the ones that were closed down long ago, were not cleaned up properly for their current reuse. A lot of these places were in, well, one of them is Spring Valley, Washington, D.C., right? After World War I, that was the hinterlands. It, just, it was part of American University. They did chemical training there, chemical, t chemical testing, did a lot of burial. And now all of a sudden, whoops, Washington, D.C. grew up right over the top of it. Right? So there's a lot of that. A lot of these things were in the hinterlands and now they're, um, now they're being used. Farmers fields, I have a lot of examples of that here that we'll go into. So we're gonna talk about these four categories. We're gonna go through how, how, we are, how we are regulated and how my clients regulate. We're gonna talk about technology and then where we're going and what is good about where we're going and what is not good about where we're going. All from a quality perspective, if I can spin that in there. Our general regulatory process is we follow the CERCLA or Superfund process right there. That is the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensa Compensation and Liability Act, CERCLA, frequently called Superfund. I told you I wasn't going to use acronyms, and here we go, CERCLA. I, I can't get away from it. CERCLA came about in 1980 as a result of the uh, Love Canal problem. It's a very interesting story. If you go and read up on it, there's actually, you, you, if you Google Love Canal, Wikipedia is the first thing that will come up. It's very interesting about how that developed, what happened there. I can, I can tell you, Hooker Chemical said in writing with lawyers, this property is not suitable for what you want to do with it. They were taken to court, they were forced to sell it, they did, they walked away, and then all of a sudden, Bang, you have Love Canal, you're moving people out. That started the EPA. They moved people out of a whole town. Uh, it had to be remediated. So that started the EPA. Congress passed CERCLA and, in 1980, and we still use uh, that as written today. It's actually a fantastic law. It stood the test of time. And these are the phases of a project. Once a site is identified, in my case, as uh, having ordinance contamination on it, it goes through a preliminary assessment and site inspection. That's a, uh, they're usually done together. We call it a PASI, more acronyms, my goodness. Uh, it's a quick first look at the site. Is it contaminated with what we think it is, in my case, military explosive ordnance? Um, if the answer to that is yes, it, the site keeps jumping through these hoops. The next thing is a remedial investigation or an RI. And that the purpose of, well, pardon me, the SI the law, the, the buzzwords in the law is it needs to determine if there is a significant risk from the contamination you expect. If it, if it makes it over that bar, it goes to the RI. The purpose of the remedial investigation is a detailed investigation to characterize the nature and extent of the contamination. That comes out of law. So you need to know the extent, how big it is, what it is. And this all applies to environmental work, which I don't do. Ted's company does some. I don't do the environmental stuff, but that would be an underground contamination plume, for example. Uh, for me, it's ordinance. Why, why, in, in what configuration, what is it, how much, what is its boundary? Then you can sort of figure out what to do about it. So it goes through the feasibility study is the next phase, which is a detailed uh, examination of what to do about it. They, the circle of the EPA and the circle of law gives nine specific criteria that have to be evaluated. Um, different things like long-term effectiveness, short-term effectiveness, implementability, um, uh, uh, regulator acceptance, community acceptance. There's nine criteria. They're all scored. And you come out with a re uh, recommended remedial alternative out of that. Um, then it goes to, and by the way, that always has to consider no further action. The law says you must consider no further action. That's something that's always a possibility. In any of these steps, a site can drop out. Say it's not worth it, it's not a big problem, we didn't find what we thought we would. But if it keeps going, then once now you have a, a, uh, a plan of action, you have directions of what you're gonna do, that is documented in a legal document called the decision document, and it goes to remedial design, where you plan to implement that remedial action. 
And then the last phase, which can last a long time, is post-removal actions. This include, includes things like um, five-year reviews. Even if you're done with the site and you say it's ready, uh, the law requires you come back every five years. Well, one of the other things too, land use controls. You may, especially in the case of ordinance, very rarely do we say done, walk away from it, don't worry about it. There's usually some training. We talk to the local police, the first responders, the local site users. We may put up signage, may have some restrictions on the site. You can't build a daycare center here because that's not what we, what we cleaned it up to be. So there's all these things and the five-year review. Come back in five years. Look at it, talk to the police, is anything being reported? Talk to the people that live there, are they having any problems? Evaluate whether the remedy that was uh, implemented in the removal action was done correctly or not. I've had sites recently where there are parts of the RA, we get to the um, five-year review and they weren't implemented. So then we say, oh, we forgot to do the training for the police, we forgot to do the, the local community training, we forgot to do the things we said we were gonna do, now's the time to do it. So it's basically go back and catch Catch up on that and look at, uh, see if the land use has changed, see if everything is still applicable. They also gave us management processes in the circle law. The EPA uh, says when you do this, you will follow the si systematic planning process. It's very inclusive. The first part of that is figuring out who the stakeholders are, analyzing the landowners of this, getting all of them involved. And as part of the systematic planning process, they say we have to develop data quality objectives. The US Army Corps of Engineers that, that pays for and manages most of the work that, that, that is munitions response, they say, yeah, we're gonna do that. We're gonna comply with that. Where instead of, they like to change the name, so instead of calling it a systematic planning process, they call it technical project planning, but it is the same thing. It's all inclusive, it's a series of meetings, and they couldn't change the name of, D, they couldn't figure out anything to call data quality objectives. So we implement data quality objectives, which are statements that describe the quantity and quality of data needed to support future decision making. Information for me, do y'all in other fields use the data quality objectives? Have you been, a, have you seen that? Yeah, it's called DMA. Huh? DMA, Define, Measure, Analyze, and Control. Define, well, okay, do y'all do all use that? We call them, we call them DQOs, because that's what EPA A calls them. And it's, it's, it's a very misunderstood thing in, in my business, but basically in conceptually, if you're going out to do a remedial investigation and you're collecting data and you don't have data quality objectives, you're just collecting data, because you don't know how much information you need, you don't know the quant quantity and quality of that information, you may be collecting too much, wasting money. You may be collecting too little when you get to your next phase and you're writing a report and you don't have the information you need to make decisions. So we get a lot of, a lot of junk DQOs because people in my business that are implementing this don't understand it. They understand it for groundwater plumes or they understand it for soil contamination, but they don't understand it for ordinance. So a lot of my, a lot of my job working for my state regulator clients is getting the Corps of Engineers and their contractors to implement the Corps of Engineers guidance. It's all written out there and they've done a very good job of taking the EPA guidance and converting it for munitions. But people in my, in my business don't seem to understand it and none of the things I'm talking about I made up. It all came out of the guidance that they developed either the EPA or the Corps of Engineers and give to us and say follow it, but it doesn't happen on the project sites which is a reason why I think some of those people need to get here, maybe from the Pentagon. We've no, I've never seen anybody at a section meeting from the Pentagon. It's like they, like they don't, I mean, I mean, I don't know what's wrong. Uh, they need to be here. Because we're going through some changes, which I'll get to later, that, let me see, did I miss one? Okay, so one of the things the, um, federal government did was they were collecting a lot of environmental data all over the country. After Love Canal and the, the, the EPA came into um, play, they developed all these Superfund sites. There's non-Superfund sites. The Superfund sites, by the way, have to make that list. There's a criteria for becoming a Superfund site. Some of my ordinance sites are, uh, most of them are not. But if it's a Superfund site, that's the EPA. That's what they do. 
and there's also under CERCLA, if you saw that, um, that's comprehensive, you know, liability and compensation. It's a lot more than just doing the work because with Love Canal, the company had changed hands, the follow-on company went bankrupt. There's nobody to pay for that. So they needed a fund, a super fund, and that's what Congress funded. And so they said, here's the money, but then part of it is the liability and compensation. You have to do clawback. You have to go to those companies, their, uh, their relatives, or follow the trail. Lawyers get involved in this, and they make a lot of money figuring out where to try, who is responsible, and who's going to repay the federal government. Sometimes they're successful, sometimes not. Um, but they got together, so DOD, DOE, and EPA are collecting a lot of environmental data, just running around, drilling holes in the ground, collecting environmental data. It wasn't compatible with anybody else's. One had certain contract specifications that didn't meet up. None of it. It was all different databases. It was basically unusable except by the people that paid for it. EPA couldn't use DOD data. So they developed a, they got together, they developed a group called the IDQTF. Another one of those acronyms that you can't really say. Intergovernmental Data Quality Task Force. And they came up with a standardized Uniform Federal Policy for Quality Assurance Project Plan, or UFP QAP. A series of standardized worksheets that sort of takes the authorship away from the work plan and makes it standardized. It starts out with worksheet one, what is our project name and where is it located? And it goes down to worksheet 37, which is the final data usability, final QA checks on data to make sure it's all good data and, and can be used. So that's the standardized worksheets. And they said, this is applicable to all US government environmental data collection. Well, a lot of the work we do is in conjunction with the environmental contractors and the Corps of Engineers that, that does the environmental work and pays for it. So they said, yeah, ordinance work is environmental data too. So they took these worksheets that were mainly geared toward um, sampling data, collecting and, and uh, a, the developing a work plan to collect either groundwater or soil data. And they modified them for munitions response. So now we use the uh, UFP QAP format too. It's a big improvement. Because you just get these work plans that were that thick and there's a lot of pros and a lot of we will do all this wonderful stuff and then it conflicted with the next chapter and it was a mess. So this sort of takes that problem out of it and is a, a, one of the things that DOD and this group did that's been very beneficial. So now I'm gonna get into number two, where we were and, uh, and where we're going. So this is a history of our technology. So I'm gonna say about 89 to roughly 2000 is what we call mag and dig. That was all we had. I started in this business in 89. I was right at the beginning of it. As a matter of fact, I got out of the Navy one week. The next Monday, I started working for UXB International as their first project manager, and they were the first UXO company working for the Corps of Engineers. So I was the first project manager at the first UXO company in the business. Not bragging, but that is the fact. So that started in 89, and all we had was mag and dig. So these were simple analog instruments that usually give you an audio signal they beep or hum when they get near metal. I'll show you an example of this in a minute. So they beep or hum, you dig <coughs> everything up, visually identify it. There are huge quality issues with it and there's production issues. This is all scrap metal, it's sort of a little blurry there. And these are pieces of scrap metal. These were all, people paid money and expended effort to dig up junk. They're not hazardous at all. This is banding and metal garbage. This one says wire nail, there's a hinge, and there's a fuel cap off of something. You find these on our ranges all the time because what we did on ranges was drive a truck down there or an old tank or something and shoot it, and pieces fly everywhere. So you, nuts, bolts, horseshoes, we find a lot of horseshoes. All this stuff has to be dug up, thrown in a bucket, categorized, recorded. Aye, 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 what a waste of money. But that was the only thing we had in uh, the 1990s. This is what mag and dig looks like. You can see there's, there's a line laid out right here. This guy has to go from there to there. This guy has to go from there to there. And they're responsible to pass their instrument, which just beeps, over every inch of that. And, and the game comes, becomes to basically sanitize the site because then the core engineers is gonna to come to this site and they're gonna go over it and if they get beeps on their magnetometer, you fail. 
because we didn't we don't know what's in the ground you have to dig everything up that is very difficult to do and their quality issues abound with this these are two ordinance detection systems unfortunately they're also people they vary one person hears differently than the other all they get is an audio signal here's a supervisor in the back he's probably fishing he's not even like it takes a lot of on-site supervision to make sure they're covering every inch of this ground they miss things we were fooling ourselves we we're you know that was all we had it's all we did we said we were doing good missed a lot of things in the ground and uh, you know these people are they're people so they're variable uh, if you do it long enough and, and typically I, I had a better picture of this I couldn't find it there were eight people in a row of those eight people on a job site on any given day three of them are hung over right I know these guys they're my friends they're, three of them are hung over guaranteed somebody just got a letter from home and they're not happy and they're, they're not doing a good job so applying QC procedures to this is nearly impossible we were fooling ourselves and this is the problem too this is in World War II this is a tech manual old thing from World War II this is a 155 millimeter projectile so it's about six inches in diameter probably the most common howitzer type of ordnance the army uses and what some crazy person did was buried it covered it with a lot of sand probably put a bunch of blast blankets on top of it to hold it down probably drove a couple a tank on top of that and detonated it that's a that's a pretty big that's a pretty big projectile it's about that big and then they dug it up and they sifted it all and these are the thousands of fragments that came off of that this is the way we kill our enemies this thing goes downrange detonates amongst your enemy and all of this stuff comes out and this is there's no nice way to say it this is the way you kill people and break things bombs do more frag but it all puts out these frags they enter people's body and they cause the problem uh, they're also all detectable by mag and dig everything on there everything on there has to be dug up and we're not looking for these we're looking for these that failed failed the function this isn't a hazard this is a hazard but you have no way of knowing what's in the ground this is the problem with uh, with mag and dig all of this stuff needs to be dug up and after bits it's been in the ground for 30 or 40 years these things become flakes of rust still detectable with the magnetometer you end up digging up flakes of rust the colossal waste of time we've gotten better about in 2000 we started using this instrument mainly this is an em61 it's a, a active electromagnetic detection system i'm going to show you how this actually works in the next couple slides from now but it records data so you have geophysicists now instead of uxo technicians rolling this thing or carrying it there's different ways to deploy it and there's a gps on top of it tells you where you've been there's the data recording package that records what the sensor is reading so this now you can apply here's something you can at least apply quality control to right you get data you can check to make sure it's working by the way one of these things we do with all of these for example for quality is is put blind seeds in the in the area that have to be found um, and uh, if you miss one it's a big deal because they're planted where you should find them we test instruments before you start work you test instruments during work so all this is applied to this and we now get actual usable data yeah we're getting a little fuzzy over here see if I make that that's what what a map looks like you sort of get the idea it's it's a plot of land it shows you where you've been and all these are this is just signal intensity so it tells you where your anomalies are and you can go back and dig them up and then if you go over this plot of land after this that thing should be gone or you should have a reason why it's still there it was a pipe in the ground or it was a fence post or something like that so you can you can now apply uh, QC to something this is that same instrument being carried in a different way like a stretcher it's one of my project sites that's Vieques Puerto Rico the big Navy bombing range so allow standard verifiable data acquisition and management of that data so that's a big a, a big uh, advantage ma'am so microphone please if you're cleaning up the bombing range how 
often does something not explode? I thought everything exploded on a bomb. No, no, that's why, I mean, nothing's 100%. And I told you DOD didn't have any quality control, right? They actually do when they, when they make these things. If you fire 100 rounds, how many will be unexploded and provide a... Rule of thumb, and we know what rule of thumb means, but I won't... Rot. Do you know? Rot, R-O-T. No, but where it came from. We actually... No, 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 it didn't come from ordinance. We had this discussion, and my wife looked it up on on the internet. Rule of thumb, and I'm not going to editorialize on this, this is just what it is, at least that's what it said it was on Wikipedia, it was a medieval law that when you beat your wife, the stick could not be any larger than your thumb diameter. in diameter. So that's, that's where rule, so it's a general rule that can sometimes be broken, I guess. Uh, uh, roughly, rule of thumb, 10%, fail the function. The reason being is they're really complex. When you look at our ordinance, they're not, they're, when you look at the job that one 155 millimeter projectile needs to do, it needs to be safe to be carried on a train through town, overseas to the war zone and not detonate. Then you're gonna put it in a gun and you're gonna fire it out. That, that 155 millimeter projectile can go 20 miles in the air. We have a new one then go 25 miles an hour, and it's um, GPS guided. It can hit anything. It's amazing, new technology. Out of a, out of a, out of a gun, so I get hammered out of a gun, goes 20 miles, arms while it's in flight, and then detonates at the right time among your, amongst your enemy. So they're very intricately made, and they sometimes fail. But they do have quality, and when, when, where they make these things, the fuses, where they load the munitions, they x-ray them, they have, very stringent quality uh, programs. But in general, 10% fail the function. Yes, ma'am. You need to, you need to think. they explode, is the material that remains, is that environmentally hazardous? No. A lot of my clients say it is, but it's steel. Why it's steel. Why not just steel? Well, we don't. We're after the ones that, that do explode. But right now, in the history of this, I haven't gotten to where we can tell without digging it up. You have to dig it up. You don't know what it is. And one of the problems with the mag and dig is when you do that for 10 years, you get lazy and you think you get smart. And you constantly have to watch out that you have the older guys that do this say, oh, I know what that is. I don't have to dig it up. I don't have to put a flag in there and come back and dig it up. I know, it's, I know that's not ordinance. They don't know. That's been proven time and time again. It's just a beep on an instrument. And the rule is, Dig it up, because if you don't, the Corps of Engineers is going to fail your grid, and you're going to have to come back and do it again anyway. Your job is to dig it all up. Ted. Um, just to follow up on what Jim was saying is there's also um, oftentimes chemical or biological agents associated with the munitions? Not often. Not often, Not often but, 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 it, but it happens. I, we, we, the industry, has found bioweapons one time, they were buried at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. I was on that project, and unfortunately the project went away because of an old timer that said, okay, give me immunity, I'll tell you what they are. The Corps of Engineers was building a building over the top of this thing, right? And I was at IT Corporation at the time, and this was great. This was like the big brass string. I was going to work on a biological uh, weapons project because they're... Up until that time, they're all pretty well, they're like nukes, they're very well guarded. But somebody brought this stuff back from Vietnam or something, buried it in the ground, and it sat there until, our best ordnance detectors, uh, ordnance detectors is a guy on a backhoe, usually putting in a sewer line or something. That's what they were doing at Wright-Patterson for a new firehouse, he's digging all of a sudden, clang, and these biological bomblets come up, they leaked all over the place. Turned out, the guy that was still there, he was in his 70s, he was just retiring out the door, uh, and he said, I'll tell you what they are. They were filled with Brucilla suis, which is fatal to swine, and makes people really sick for about two weeks. Kills about 10% of people that come in contact with it, but it's designed to get people off the, or it was designed to get people off the battlefield. Make them really sick, and then you have two people have to carry the sick person off the battlefield. But it had a 45-day shelf life, because it was alive. No, Brucilla suis. Anthrax, totally different problem. That's a spore, lasts forever. Brucilla suis was a live agent 
um, liquid, 45 day shelf life. So those, they were buried in the 70s. There was no, no hazard associated with them. Chemical, we do, we do work on. They're also, um, they're, they're also very well controlled. And I'm not talking about, I mean, the, the, the projects are well controlled. We know where the firing ranges are. We know where the testing areas were. We know where they were buried. And the Corps has an entire, it's actually Army, has an entire program going after the chemical stuff, which I sometimes get involved with. I mean, those are great projects too. Um, but we're not really talking about bio because there's hardly any of that. Not talking about chemical because it's different than this and it's only 2% of our work. We're also not talking about underwater. Can you talk a little about the Incas? I mean, that, that, as a retired Marine, uh, I've, I've, I've dropped a lot of ordnance there on those beaches. They're one of the, some of the most contested beach locations in the, in the United States, the Puerto Rico. Um, contested? How, how, how much, well, they never liked us there in the first place. And yeah. Now that those beaches are being returned back to the Puerto Ricans, um, how, are you working there to, to make them safe? Well, I, I work for the Commonwealth. So the Navy, this is a base closure, so the Navy is doing this work. Uh, first of all, thank you. It's a, it's a great project. I've been working yeah, on it for... It's been a fascinating year. I'll tell you a story afterwards. I've been working on it for probably 14 years. Um, I'm going in a couple weeks. There's Vieques and Culebra, a neighboring, neighboring island is a FUDS. It was also, but that, that one was closed. This one's being closed by a Navy. The Navy's doing a really good job. Um, they're putting about $10 million into the cleanup. They have a con one of the benefits of working in Puerto Rico is you just work all year long. There are project sites in Alaska where we have a six week work window. They work all year long. They have standardized procedures they're going through. Uh, most of the bombing range is is not being cleaned up for reuse. It was given to Fish and Wildlife as a, uh, as a wildlife area, but Fish and Wildlife goes there, they manage it, there's turtles, they do a lot of research. Some of it uh, closer to the uh, west, which is where Camp Garcia was, so people were living there, is open to the public and there's a lot of trails. So they've, they've really, um, they're doing a great job, really. Oh, that's, that's great to hear. It's not in the news anymore. Right. It was highly conten contentious. They wanted uh, locals, uh, did not want the Navy there. And so we left. We also left Kohalave, Hawaii. These, these places sound like great places, but they're really, I mean, that is really not fun work. Uh, and to, to get out to that point, which is on the eastern part of the Vieques Range, you probably have an hour and a half trip in a truck bouncing over, you'll, you'll probably get two flat tires on the way out there, you'll probably get two. By the time you get out to the work site, you are beat. It's hot, you're beat, you're changing tires all the time because there's all these spikes that just, it's just what grows there. It's a scrubby, spiky stuff. You cut it down, it comes up and it bites your tires. They go through a lot of tires, they spend a lot of money, but they trained locals to, to do the work. We, they, we came out, originally you had to be in the military to do this work, and then they said, well, we're running out of people, and that's not really, it's a very different mission, what we did in the military. So I said, let's train uh, people. We, there, there are some training courses where you can be a UXO Tech 1, and the DOD has standardized this. And then after three years, you can become a Tech 2, and then a Tech 3, and a supervisor. And there's people on Vieques that are now working all over the world. They're supervisors, and they started on that project. So the Navy's done a good job of trying to turn around the uh, perceptions uh, of that. And I'm really happy to be associated with that. So this was a big, uh, big advantage going to, uh, uh, a big advance going to DGM. Now we're going to AGC, Advanced Geophysical Classification, using specially developed sensors just for this. Up until, until now, we're dealing with sensors that were used to detect many other things. This was a program um, that was designed, what classification is, it was originally called discrimination discriminating objects in the ground, scrap from really what we're looking for from ordnance. And then when they got serious about it and said, well, we're gonna roll this out, discrimination has negative connotations, let's call it something else. We'll call it classification. So it's classifying, making decisions about an object in the ground without seeing it based on the geophysical data. I'm gonna tell you briefly how we do that. But the advantage is, if you leave it in the ground, you save money, time, do more work quicker, Right, a lot better. Not digging up all those scrap pieces, horseshoes. 
DOD developed it through the ESTCP. And a gentleman that he was supposed to be here was the guy who ran this program. I would, really would have loved to have him. His name is Herb. He actually developed some slides that I'm going to use later to explain it. This is their website. They do a lot of things. They are EST, CERDIP is, I forget what it stands for. SCRDP is, it's, it's basic R&D. ESTCP, Environmental Security Technology Certification Program, takes an idea or an existing technology and advances it or tailors it to the DOD's needs. And that's what they did. They've been doing this for 15 years with a bunch of contractors and this program is ending this year. And the reason it's ending is they're done. This is ready to be pushed out and it's gonna be used. Um, it's already being used. It's one of the problems. This is what one of these sensors look like. This is the TEMTADS. I forget what that stands for. The EM is electromagnetic, so T-E-M-T-A-D-S. As you can see, there, this, this has sensors in each corner. It basically gets, I'm gonna show you an uh, example of this. It gets three-dimensional data on an object in the ground. We have our ever-present uh, GPS sensor under here. There's no way you can see it. it's very small. There's a pitch and yaw uh, recorder or sensor, so if it's on a hillside and the GPS antenna is offset, it compensates for that, or if you go sideways a little bit. This was a, this is a site, this was a, a ESTCP uh, project site, and this is San Luis Obispo, California. These places sound great, but it, it, it's now, this is a FUDS, formerly used defense site, it is now uh, a research farm for uh, Cal Poly San, San Luis Obispo. This is a big hill going down there. They wanted to test it on a side hill. This is, this is trucks and a trailer. Way, it looks like it's right behind him. That's way down a big hill. So they, did, they wanted to operate this in a more difficult scenario. And uh, that's what they did. If you see a side slide that looks like this, it was developed by Herb Nelson of ESTCP. He's the guy who ran this program for the past 15 years. And I just used his slides because he told me I could and I really couldn't improve on him. But, we want to find this, we don't want to find that, to answer your question. We want to leave that stuff in the ground. These are big pieces of fragments. They're usually a lot smaller than this. So, uh, he animates this slide, so I got to keep that. So, uh, sort the metal into two classes, what we want to find and what we don't want to find. This again is the problem. This is more representative. These are, these up here are the size of this. These are half that size and then we're getting down to real small. We want to leave that stuff in the ground, if possible. So the, this used specific sensors, or it did research and, and, and development with specific sensors. This one was made by Lawrence Berkeley Lab. It's called the BUDS. It's not being fielded. It was a test demo. This is Metal Mapper. It exists. You can buy it. You can see this one has three dimensions. One sensor this way, one this way, and one this way. This is an earlier version of the TEMTADS, and this is a handheld uh, thing called MPV. These work the same. Um, and we're gonna talk about these a little bit. So this is the EM61, when we were in the digital geophysical mapping era. Is that me, something I'm doing? No. I don't know what that is. This is the way the EM61 works, and it's still used today. And we still do mag and dig today. These things still have, all have their applications, but we're gonna move as much as possible to uh, analog um, uh, advanced sensors using uh, classification. It has a transmit coil and a receive coil. They're the same coil. So it basically, if you could picture it sort of like a sonar, where you send out a sound and then listen for the response. That's what this does. It transmits, it develops, it has a coil, you shoot that with electricity, a certain signal, and it does it on different frequencies. Shut that off, and what that signal does, what that electromagnetic radiation does, is creates a secondary induced field in any metal in the ground. And then you shut it off and you listen, you read this signal, and it's dying very rapidly, but you get enough data for, so it says, I'm here, I'm here. That's basically what it is. Now this is advanced uh, geophysical sensors. As you can see, you have three axes and they fire in sequence. This, uh, the, the, the EM61 does that on four different frequencies, 10 times a second. This has three different axes. 
that it, that it fires on different frequencies. It's, I forget the number. It's exponential. It's 160 some odd times a second. And you get this data in three. So you can, so you're getting three looks at everything as you roll across it. And what you do with that data when you process it is you get curves. This is the time and this is the signal intensity. So you see as, as the time goes out, the signal intensity drops off. But since you're doing it, you're getting three, three looks, basically, data at the same time from three different angles on every object. You get three different curves based on the characteristics of that object. Let me see if he has a curve. So the shape of the curve reflects the shape of the object. This is three curves. Two of them are right on top of each other because this, a projectile we're looking for, is axially symmetric. It's round and long, right? In three dimensions, round. So these are those two curves, and this is the long axis. So just by looking at that data, just by what I told you, you know that even if you don't know what this is, you know that's something you're interested in because it's round in cross-section and it's long. We want to dig that up. This is a horseshoe. They don't overlap. That's not axial, actually symmetrical. You know you can leave that in the ground. We've gotten a lot more sophisticated than that, but just by looking at that data, you can tell that. Now, another benefit of this, I told you the two sensors are fielding are Metal Mapper and TEMTADS 2x2. Two two. This is EM61 data. This is all, this is the same plot of land. The navigation accuracy is much greater, and the detail in the TEMTADS, because it's very close to the ground, and there's a lot of benefits to it, is much better than this. It's, it took this big blob and shows you specific things that are there. So it's sort of a side benefit of the advanced sensors is much more detail in the, uh, in the data. So target of interest is what we're looking for. And this is just an example of how we do it. Now, I told you, you, you can tell, you know this is a munition we're interested in because these two curves, the green and the blue overlap, the red doesn't, that is actually symmetrical. But we can match this up to, to real things. Um, this, um, that first one, let me go back, that first one, uh, we match things in a library. It should, okay, so this is a, this is a, a curves for a 37 millimeter projectile. This is just bigger because you're getting more of a signal back for it. So it's not a 37. This is for a 105 millimeter projectile. It's smaller than a 105. And this matches up. The gray is a 75. That is a 75 millimeter projectile. And the DOD has developed a library for this. And it's extensive. They've gone out and get all the, uh, all the munitions that we know, that we made, that uh, other countries have made. They've taken the data. And they are maintaining this library. So they can match things up uh, very accurately. You can see that is a piece of junk. There's no symmetry. This other one, they're actually putting things in the library like horseshoes. So they'll be able to say, yeah, that's a horseshoe. Then there's a quality control check. Dig that up. Is it a horseshoe or not? Your geophysicist called it as that. So you can dig those things up and check to make sure you're doing it right. This is an example of the benefit we're getting. We're not really using this anymore. This is a rock curve, receiver operating characteristics curve. This is 100%, it represents all of the ordnance up here. So in this case, these were the contractor or the demonstrator said, we're gonna dig everything up to this blue line. And in fact, they got all of the ordnance, all of the targets of interest, everything green is a thing they said you don't have to dig up and we don't think it's ordnance. And it turned out in all these cases to be true. In this case, they dug a few extra. In this case, they were right on, but digging a few extra isn't bad. It's eliminating the digging on these thousands of things. That is the benefit we're getting. So we uh, have developed, the DOD has developed process QC for this, the sensors and equipment. They're ready, they're standardized, they're ready to be sold. Uh, QC, they built uh, processing uh, computer systems called UX Analyze. That is, QC is built into it. And every, there are decisions that we make because nothing matches up perfectly. So you make a decision uh, based on your early data. Is, does the match have to be within, usually you pick something like 85%. So up to 85% of a match, you say we're gonna dig it, we're gonna put it on a dig list, but then you have to test that. And we have ways to test that. So all that is built in. They developed a UFP QAP. 
it's built in and we're just starting to field this now. So I'm almost done. ESTCP is going to develop a summary of all their work they've done the past 15 years. There is, this is the Uniform Federal Project Quality Assurance Project Plan is being modified for advanced geophysics. And we're having a contractor, or they're having a contractor accreditation program, which I'm going to tell about on the next slide. So what's good about this is they're serious about it. They developed the QAP. The accreditation program is called the DAGCAP, Digital Advanced Geophysic Con Geophysics Contractor Accreditation Program. It, is, it was developed by the Department of Defense guys that developed the original UFP QAP, and they came out of the in environmental laboratory business. So that's what they know. So they are basing this accreditation program on the ELAP program, which is the Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Program. It has an international standard for it. Uh, they're writing quality systems requirements. That, that's all good things. It's being implemented by accrediting bodies. The same type of companies that accredit environmental laboratories are going to do this. That's the good things. It's also sort of the bad things. Vastly more stringent and complex than anything we've done to date. I'm not sure the industry is going to be able to adapt to this. They're not giving them any lear learning curve. They're going to say, by such and such a date, I don't think they've announced that date, but they're going to say, you need to be accredited to do this work. I'm not sure the contractors are going to be able to handle it. I'm a little worried about that. The accrediting bodies, they have to spin up to do it. They're li they have all these systems in place for accrediting and inspecting laboratories, but they have to spin all that up and do that for uh, now uh, advanced geophysical classification, that's going to cost them money and they're going to have to be reimbursed. They're, well, some of them are non-for-profits, but I don't think they want to lose money and it's going to cost them a lot to do it. Another big problem, I, so I don't know how many contractors are going to want to pay to do this. It's, they're going to have to write all these SOPs. They're going to have to comply with things that are much more stringent and I think it's going to be a big risk for them. And when I was at IT Corporation, I would have had gone to a vice president to say, I want to do this and I need a million dollars. And I think that vice president would probably say something like, well, why you hold off for a couple of years? We'll just use subcontractors to do this. We'll put markup on them. There's no risk and then we'll see how it shakes out. So I don't know if there's going to be a bunch of people lining up to do this the way the DOD. Uh, there, I, the way I look at it, DOD is, they've done a great job up until now, but they're not minimizing their risk. I, I, I think there are other steps they could do to minimize risk. Another problem they have is performance-based contracting. So we'll talk a little bit about that. I think this is antithetical to quality. It's hands-off. It was, there was, in this work, in environmental work, you don't know how many things you're going to have to dig up, so they were using cost plus fixed fee contracts, and they keep getting extended. We di we're digging up more, we need more money. So the DOD wanted to get away with that, and they wanted to go to some kind of a firm fixed price contracting for this work. Very difficult to do. They came up with foreign space which is basically the contractor sinks or swims. The attitude is the contractor is the expert. If they fail, they don't get paid. We bring somebody else in, no skin off our nose. Um, the problem with that is that even when I go to a site and I want to talk to a contractor, and you can see a, sometimes a contractor is very well-intentioned, but they just need a little help, a little mentoring. I'm not allowed to give it to them. Certainly the core is not allowed to give it to them because then that, that would constitute a change order. Right? So it's just like stand there and watch the train wreck happen. And that train wreck happens all the time. And if it happens with classification, I'm afraid people aren't going to develop the confidence that we need to have as regulators and land users that it works. So the regulator, the buyer, the Corps of Engineers stands back and they, don't, they say, we're not going to help you, contractor. We're not going to mentor you. Me, working for the regulators, we're the enforcer of quality. We have to go find the problem. We're the one that has to say, hey, core, they're failing. They're not getting the stuff. I've gone out there and found it myself. They're not doing the job right. I have to do that. The buyer's not doing that. And that is antithetical to ASQ. I've been getting these ASQ trainings for supplier management. It's all about supplier auditing. Uh, mentoring suppliers, how to handle supplier non-conformance, non improving customer satisfaction. They don't do any of that. That's why I say DOD needs to be here. People from the Pentagon and Corps of Engineers need to be here in this, that there are other ways to do this. They, they're accepting failure. 
uh, they're just refusing to pay for it, which is like half the way. But it's really costing com companies a lot of money and a lot of heartache, and people are fired, and they're trying to do a good job, but nobody helps them. I don't like it. But that's it. I'm done. Thank you very much. I appreciate you all listening. I'll take any questions. Typically, state departments of environmental quality, that sort of an organization. But, but, why don't you ask it again so we can get it on the Bruce, recording? Are the regulators typically state departmental or environmental quality sort of organizations? Yes. Yes, it's usually the state. Uh, sometimes the county will have a representative there if they're interested, our local municipalities, zoning people. We like to get their help because when we get to the last stage of it and we need to implement land use controls, the core walks away, the state walks away, and the locals are there to enforce zoning, for example. Say, no, if you're going to dig here or if you're going to do uh, some certain type of construction, you need to get a permit, you need to come talk to us, and you know they'll usually run it by the Corps of Engineers or us to say, is this okay? Something like that. You need triggers for those things. We rely on the locals for that. If it is a Superfund site, then the EPA is in charge and the state is there as a co-regulator. They invite the state as a stakeholder. Superfund sites I have, Vieques is a Superfund site, Fort Ord, uh, California, Williams Air Force Base, Arizona. A lot of them are Superfund sites. They're usually there for more reasons than just ordinance. <coughs> Williams Air Force Base is an Air Force Base with runways, so it has groundwater plumes and, 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 and fuel contamination, a lot of other things going for it. But by the way, it is a Superfund site, so the ordinance comes under that, too, and the EPA gets involved. So you mentioned that this talk didn't include underwater. Are there problems underwater? Yeah, huge, huge problems. But but they're underwater, so less people are exposed to them. But we, a, a couple of years ago, um, a clamor off the coast of New Jersey was burned by a mustard agent that came up in a uh, World War I projectile that was dumped off the Atlantic Ocean. And a couple of years before that, people started finding World War I chemical pro uh, projectiles in their driveways. The clamors were bringing them up, putting them through the clam processing plants, they get thrown on a pile with, as junk with a bunch of clams, and then the landscapers come, uh, U.S. Up. hand grenades and, uh, no, pardon me, it was French hand grenades and U.S. Uh, 75 millimeter projectiles on people's driveways in Delaware. The Corps had a big project to go to all these driveways and, and find them. They found a lot. They found a lot. But the guy, see, there's a disconnect there, too, uh, that I, I sort of... The DOD doesn't understand that's a problem. It's sort of out of sight, out of mind. I read where a DOD representative said, well, it's not that big a problem because the clamors pick up one or two a year. But then we go talk to the clamors. They say, no, we get 50 or 60 a day. And we stack these things up like cordwood, and we throw them overboard at the end of the day before we go in the port. So this one guy, one was leaking, leaked mustard on him, burned him. Uh, but the rest of them are being spread all over the place. They pick them up when they're, the way they do clamming is sort of interesting. I looked into it. They drag a sled behind a boat and they inject high pressure water into the, 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 the ocean floor and that stirs up everything in a big cloud of dust and then they drag a net right behind that. So everything gets popped up and then they bring the net on board, sort them, clean them, hand them in and, and it's a very effective way that they could clean up the ocean, I think, if they would dedicate some of those boats to looking for uh, 75 millimeter chemical projectiles instead of clams, but we're not doing that. Uh, it's sort of one guy got burned that was settled out of court. And I've never heard any more about it. So then, where does the land end and the water start? Usually at mean low tide. Usually, and if somebody's doing a like in Vieques. They'll, the, these instruments, most of them can get wet. They'll go in there up to their knees and say, we're going to go a little farther and, and, and we can reach down and, and get things. But we don't, when I, when I mentioned Herb Nelson at ESTCP getting done with this, he is now moving to underwater detection. And they're going to, they're probably, they're having some early luck with new specific sensors. Because right now we take our land sensors and drag them underwater. It's not really working very well. We're, again, we're fooling ourselves. We're at the stage of fooling ourselves. 
So they're developing some low frequency electromagnetics that can see through coral or can detect through coral. And it's just in the very, very early stages. He's leaving the classification on land and he's moving into uh, underwater projects because the next thing they're going to tackle. One of the situations in water is off Guam Air, uh, Guam, the island of Guam, the Pacific Anderson Air Force Base during Vietnam. If a B-52 came back and it hadn't released all of its ordnance, you were required to drop it on the west side of the island before you landed on runway uh, 06. And in the coral, there are big gashes which create super riptides to anybody who would go swimming there because you will be taken two miles out because you no longer have the buffer and you essentially have a Venturi effect. And that's why they marked all of those uh, water accesses as dangerous currents don't go there and they would threaten the younger guys and their families court martial if you happen to go there. So there are some issues. Why don't we hear about it? Because Guam is where America's day begin and the people just don't get that excited about it. There, uh, I thought you were going to say when talking about coral, we're very concerned, the, the, the Corps and the Navy are very concerned with the, uh, endangered species. And we're starting to do underwater work on Vieques and every time we find something we have to have, it's coral, it's the, the, the contractors can't touch it until it's approved. We have to have a meeting with NOAA, National Marine Fisheries, EPA, because it's a Superfund site, my client and the Environmental Quality Board. We have to get together, look at the situation, decide what we're going to do about it. And, you know, if it's encrusted with coral and they don't want to lose that and nobody has access to it, I'm okay with it. You know, if it can't hurt anybody. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, the stuff's going to go away eventually when it, when it decomposes in the ocean. It will release toxins. Explosives are highly toxic. High explosives are. Uh, but it is the ocean. That's not my call. Uh, but as far as, you know, I'm concerned with the uh, hazard to people of coming in contact with it and causing a detonation. If they can't get to it because of coral, that solves my problem. You know, I think they should. I think they should. I, I would like to, DOD doesn't like talking to me. They don't invite me and say, Jim, what do you think? You know, if they did, I'd say you need to change your procedure. Because on, on land, we have the three R's. They instituted the three R's. And I thought it was sort of grade school in the beginning, but they're recognize, retreat, and report. And that's pretty good advice. This industry start, started uh, when it did because in the mid 80s, two kids were killed in Tierra Santa. It was a de development in San Diego, which used to be a, uh, an army uh, range, it was the former Camp Elliott. So it was a FUDS and they, were, they built a, 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 a housing development on it in a beautiful place. It had parks and the kids were playing off of a, off of a trail. Found a 37 millimeter projectile, which is about that big played with it and killed both of them. All of a sudden, we're now looking for UXO. It created this industry. So people, yeah, people do get hurt with these things. Um, so one of the things DOD does is go to places like that where there can't, e even if we do the project, we never get it all. The contractors will never say, I guarantee I got it all. So as part of that post-closure uh, procedures is go and give training in the three R's, put posters up in the schools, the DOD has coloring books, recognize, retreat, and report. Well, when the fishermen came and said, you know, we'd like a little advice on what to do this, uh, DOD had one hammer, right? So everything looks like a nail. Recognize, retreat, report. Oh, you're on a ship, you can't retreat. So recognize, throw it overboard, and report. But nobody reports. And so that's just, that's just what they do pitch it overboard. And they're not going to take the time from their sorting clams. They're not going to say, oh, man, stop. Everybody stop. I have to go over here and throw this thing overboard. They're going to get done with their day. They stack them on the side. They get 50 or 60. Before they go into port, they pitch them over.